What wondrous love is this? O oh, my soul, O oh, my soul. What wondrous love is this, O oh, my soul? What wondrous love is this that calls the Lord of bliss to dread bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. We have been looking over the past few weeks of the meaning of the cross. We know that the cross shows that God atoned for our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice. We know he also did this as an example that we too should bear our crosses. But this morning we come to affirm that the cross, pure and simple, is an act of love. Jesus said to his disciples, greater love hath no one than this, that one lays down his life for his friends. And then he laid down his life for you and for me. And the song says, oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life, what more could he give? Oh, how he loves you and me. In the midst of a cruel and hateful world, Jesus intentionally chose to love, to love beyond all measure. Jesus was born into a world that was much like ours. It was filled with hatred and violence and cruelty. And when we look at the cross, we see the greatest cruelty of all. And yet even from the cross, Jesus chose to love those who were crucifying him, offering to them forgiveness and understanding as he says father they know not what they do jesus walked in a world that was filled with violence he walked in a time when there was also illness though we are facing the coronavirus jesus often walked among those who had leprosy and he loved them and he brought healing to them uh, this situation which we're in this COVID-19 outbreak, it can bring out the best of us or the worst of us, and we are seeing both. I have a friend that recently went on Facebook to ask us to refrain from racist jokes, for her son is Asian. He's already fearing. How could we do such to a child? And yet we also see the best in us. I know one of our members told me that this past week she was at the grocery store and she'd gotten all of the things and she was trying to hurry out of there and as she was standing in the line she thought, oh no, I forgot the eggs. And she said that out loud and as she said that, the young woman that was right behind her reached into her basket and handed her the dozen eggs and said, ma'am, don't go running back there, I'll go. You just finished checking out. It can bring out the best of us and the worst of us. Or maybe it just brings out who we already are. But I do think that we have a choice in that. I think that we can make choices to love. Christianity is a faith that grew, that actually flourished in the midst of the great plagues. Why was that? Because Christianity is a faith of love and concern. Christians were able to give meaning amidst difficult times to say that God still loves and that God is here and to be with others. In 1665, the bubonic plague, that which was called the Black Death, came upon a village of Eom in Derbyshire, England. There, because a bell of cloth was brought in that, that had fleas in it and infestation, 42 villagers passed away before anything could be done. Many of the folks saw this death coming and they wanted to escape. They wanted to flee to other towns. William Moppison was the pastor of that small village. He began to preach a message of love. He began to tell the folks that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves and if we are to go to other towns we will simply take this disease, this plague upon them. And all agreed to stay put. No other towns around them got the plague because they did not go. But it did come with a cost. 260 people in that village gave their lives so that it might not spread to others. They didn't just die. They gave 
meaning to life. They sacrificed so that others might live. Christians knew, as we know today, that death does not have the final word. When we look at the cross and we look at the love of God, we know that that is not the last. That it may be Friday, but Sunday is coming. That God can redeem even death. Christians know that God is loving despite what the world may say, despite what we may think. But they also know that that love, to be real, must be lived out sacrificially. Real love is a giving love. It's not a love that just says, I love you with words, but puts action to that. One of my favorite Bible stories is in the book of 2 Samuel. It is when King David is called to build an altar and he goes to a man named Arana. And Arana has a threshing floor, a place where they take the wheat and they throw it in the air and they separate the shaft and the wheat. And it is the place where King David decides the altar should be built. Arana comes out and says, Oh, King, just take the land. It is yours. To which King David replies, I will not sacrifice to the Lord God that which cost me nothing. He insists on paying the full price for the land. How can we give to God that which cost us nothing? What in this time of crisis will we, who are people of faith, sacrifice? Some of our convenience? We might have to stay home sometime. Maybe some of our money may we give to some charities or to our church. Maybe it's our time. But what would real sacrifice look like? I see doctors and nurses online holding up signs that say, we've come to work for you. You stay home for us. May we need to sacrifice some of our convenience, yes. But I think it should go even deeper than that. I think in the midst of this time, we need to turn to God and what we need to sacrifice is our own selfishness and our own pride. And we need to enter into a time of prayer for our world, a prayer for peace, a prayer for health. We need to get on the phone and call one another and to check on those who are lonely and let them know that though we cannot be with them physically, they are not alone. When I think of a sacrificial act of love, I am grateful that my parents show that to my family. Even before I was born, when my father and my mother were first dating, they were in different places. My father was a student at Auburn University in Alabama. My mother was a student at Greensboro College in Greensboro here in North Carolina. And, and, and their dating was long distance, mainly by letters and a few phone calls. After they were engaged and they decided to get married, my father decided to join the Air Force and enlisted. When they were married in a little town in South Georgia, just a few days later, he had to go to Japan where he would be stationed. He was flown there, but my mother had to take a ship, and it took several weeks, and on that time, she started thinking, well, I don't really know this guy. Uh, we've dated long distance, and I'm about to go to Japan and become his wife or live with him. They'd already been married. And, and she decided that while she was going, she'd make a plan. She had already looked up the name of some Methodist missionaries, for she was Methodist at that time, and she knew where they lived, and she decided that if she got there and she really didn't like this guy, what she would do is she would just go run away and become a missionary, that she would just give her life for God. Fortunately, they got along. When they saw each other again, the, the love blossomed and bloomed. And they lived together, not only there in Japan, where my father not only served in the Air Force, but also began to preach around different villages. And my father and mother began a partnership in ministry. They were willing to sacrifice for one another. They were willing to build upon a relationship. Real love is sacrificial. It's not about what we can get out of something, but what is it that God is having us to do? That marriage was based on service to God. For they knew that God was with them. I want you to hear something very, very important this morning. 
though we need to practice what's been called social distancing, although I think physical distancing may be a better term, for we are still connected to one another, we just need to stand apart for a while. Though we need to practice this, God does not practice social distancing. God is with us. As the great psalm says, God is our refuge and strength in ever-present time and help of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the sea, though the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is with her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Almighty God is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He will make wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters his spear. He burns his shield with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You see, in this midst of times when we are apart, God is with each of us, pulling us back together. Christians know that God is love and that that love was shown upon a cross and as that cross is lifted up, if that example of sacrificial love is our example of faith, people will be drawn to God's very presence. I've been asked by many, did God cause this epidemic? I do not believe so. I believe the answer is no. You might say, well, Pastor, what biblical rationale do you have for that? And I'm reminded that when people came to Jesus after a tower had fallen in a town called Siloam, and many had died, and they said, why were these people killed? Was it because of their sins? And Jesus said, no, they were no sinful than the rest of the world. One time they brought to Jesus a man who had been born blind, and they began an argument with him, and they said, did his parents sin or did he sin? Whose sin caused this blindness? And Jesus says, no one's sin caused this blindness. But God can work through it. And God's great grace can be shown. And Jesus took that discussion about what was right and wrong and who caused what. And he reached out and he healed the blind man. That was Christ's response to pain and hurt. You might say, well, Pastor, but it's not the result of God doing it to us. Then how does this happen? Like all pain in our world, it happens because we live in a broken and fallen world. Because God is a God of love who loves us so much that God gives to us freedom. And God created everything perfectly and humanity sinned and brokenness came into our world and death came into our world and all those things that literally plague us became a part of the world in which we live but God would not leave that world alone but in his love he reached down he reached down and gave us the law he reached down and gave us the prophets, and ultimately he reached down in his own son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and he gave to us his own love. You see, though God does not cause these tragedies, God can redeem anything. We know that Romans 8, 28 says that all things work together for good for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Not that all things are good, but all things can be redeemed. God can take anything and, and bring good out of it. I have a pastor friend that likes to say, I can't wait to see what God does with this. 
he didn't listen in the pastoral care classes when we learned to empathize with somebody. When, when someone comes to him and says, you know, Pastor, I, I lost my job. He says, well, I can't wait to see what God does with this. I bet God has something really good for you in store. Someone comes to him with a heartbreak and, and, and they've broken up with someone and they say, I'm just hurting. And he'll say, I can't wait to see how God will redeem this and show you a love that is beyond all understanding. I'm fearful for what might happen, what has already happened around the world, what can happen here in our own community, in our own country. But I know that God can do great things even in the midst of great suffering. Some of you perhaps have seen on YouTube a young boy from Singapore. He's 12, and he singed a song called Singapore Unite. I love the words. You should go on and, and listen to him sing the song. He says, you are shut away. You are isolated, cut off from civilization. All alone with your hopes and dreams, shattered, no longer free. But I want you to know that you are not alone, and I want you to feel that you are at home. But we will be together through thick and thin, as one country will fight this virus and win. We'll fight with our hearts and our minds and our souls, protecting this island where we call our home. Why did he write that? This young man is a Christian. He goes to Fairfield Methodist Primary School. His teachers had been talking about writing songs. He had no musical abilities. He had never written a song before, but he wanted to do something in the midst of the virus outbreak in Singapore to bring people together. And particularly, he wrote the song for the doctors and nurses and other staff who are at the National University Hospital in Singapore. You see, even at 12, he understood that good could come out of tragedy and that we could be brought together in faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and brought together in love for one another. You see, his name is Jacob. And Jacob knows pain. When he was younger, his parents divorced. It, it caused him great turmoil, and he wasn't sure about God or if God really loved him. And then uh, two years ago, when he was only 10, his mother was hospitalized. She had a blood clot, and it was very, very close to her heart. And if it broke loose, she could have a stroke, and she could die. Jacob would go and visit with his mother. And every day, this is what his mother did in the hospital. She would read scripture and she would pray. They would read Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. You see, that song that Jacob wrote was a song not just about unity, but a song about faith. Jacob said that he kept his faith in Christ because he saw his mother's faith. He saw her in the midst of facing a trial reach out to God, whom she loved with all of her heart and mind and soul, and pray each and every day. This is the love that we have from our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us, that he sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his own son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another.